Hey everyone, thank you, Catherine. This is Brittany Braun. I work at the department. I am the 619B coordinator and have corresponded with many of you as I provide technical assistance and support to the TS Gold OSEP account. Um, just wanna say thank you for joining us today and reiterate that um, Catherine and I will be recording the webinar and ensuring that we send it out after um, this concludes. So be sure to make sure you add any questions into the chat box and um, we will ensure that if we do not get to your questions today, we will um, follow up as well. Perfect. So learning objectives for today, we will do an overview of some really helpful reports to run. Um, we'll also spend just a little bit of time going through the difference between the OSEP license and birth to five license. And then the, the real focus will be on exit assessment uh, and checkpoint and learning how to troubleshoot with exit um, and checking eligibility and, and really all of those steps that you need to take as we're approaching um, the time of year when you would be really looking to, to focus on exiting children. So, see here some of the reports that we'll be touching on today will cover the federally mandated report what you can get from that report um, how you can use the OSEP status report as well uh, among others and then wanted to touch briefly on differences here um, Brittany do you want to take this one So essentially in the early childhood license, you have all of your publicly funded children that are ages um, birth through five years old that are not receiving uh, IDA uh, Part B services. And then in the OSEP license, you have all of the children who do receive those uh, children and then are not publicly funded. And then there's this space in between those two where there is some overlap. So there are publicly funded children that also receive IDEA Part B services. And so just wanna be clear that when we're talking about exit, we wanna make sure that we are only looking at exiting children in the OSEP license. You won't need to take any additional steps in the ECE license um, for those children that do have duplicate accounts. And let me see here if we have some additional questions coming in. All right, seems like sound issues are, are fine. So I'll continue to move forward. And so for some of just the, the basic differences between the license, we have this slide, we will be sharing out uh, the slide deck after this. So if you do want to review this, um, we can certainly share that and, and, and you can review it. But essentially the, the item sets between the two licenses are different. Um, and importantly, the OSEP license does not require documentation to finalize a rating as the uh, ECE license does, in part because for those children that are duplicated, we, we are not asking that teachers um, go in and, and copy have, and have dual sets of, of documentation. So for those instances, they'd be able to um, put their ratings over into the OSEP license uh, and wanted to, to clarify that. And so one of the things that we'll be touching on once we actually get into the demo are some helpful things to check when you are setting your uh, columns to display in the admin area. And that can be helpful specifically for making sure that you've appropriately marked uh, having IEP, as well as making sure that you've put the LICID into the student ID field, uh, which is important for student transfers and um, being able to communicate with Brittany uh, about um, what is PII otherwise. And this I would like Brittany to address here. Hey, thank you, Catherine. 
Sorry about the technical uh, issues, muting and unmuting. So um, I just want to quickly review when to transfer, transfer and exit a student. Um, if you are going to exit an archive in the OSEP license, that should take place when a student is getting ready to matriculate into kindergarten um, or the child is turning six before the kindergarten year. So if that student is exiting 619B services, um, but will continue to receive special education services in the KEA license. Um, additionally, if a student is found to be no longer um, receiving special education services before that child transitions to kindergarten, then that child should also be exited and archived within the license. And finally, if a student is moving out of state, um, and you receive notice in time to complete that assessment. So we want to ensure that when one of those three instances take place, not only is the child being archived, but that the exit assessment is being completed prior to archiving that child. In an instance where you would only archive and you would not complete an exit assessment, that would take place when a student has relocated to a new school system within Louisiana, Therefore, we would be transferring that child from one school system to the next. In that case, the transfer process should be initiated so that the new school system can access the student records. In your back to school checklist, there is also explicit language that you can utilize when requesting that transfer. Okay, thank you, Brittany. And so we have some additional reminders here about exit this year. So because we have our entry assessments primarily completed in gold uh, for, well, for anyone who entered this year, they would have a gold entry assessment. There might be some who transitioned from AEPS who might still have a COSA form, but gold should always be used for exit. And really most of the children that you should be working with at this point um, would have gold for entry as well. And so we will definitely be um, going through completing checkpoints and what that really means and how we can help you with that. Um, Brittany, do you want to discuss the rolling checkpoints and how, how we handle rolling checkpoints in, in gold um, for this license specifically? Yes, so this license differs a little bit from the general education early childhood license. Um, for kiddos within this license, we need to ensure that there is both an entry and exit assessment. However, that does not correspond to the typical three-point checkpoints that take place in the original license. So within this license, because children are receiving services at various times throughout the duration, we want to ensure that within six weeks of starting services, they receive an entry assessment that may or may not coincide exactly with the checkpoint date, but it will be considered that entry checkpoint within whatever window of time that takes place. And that's the same for the exit assessment. We want to ensure that a child completes an exit assessment uh, prior to transitioning to kindergarten or within six weeks of turning six. Um, if those take place within the same year, then there is no need to add an additional mid-year assessment. However, if the child rolls over to a second year, that's when you would add a mid-year assessment. And do you want to review these timelines as well? Sure. So again, for the entry assessment, that really needs to be completed within six weeks of the child receiving the first day of their special education services. Again, that is regardless of the due date. For the middle of the year assessment, that would be for any children who are served in special education settings for more than two years. Districts can choose to complete this at any of the three checkpoints. And for the exit assessment, that must be completed in the ring, both for the child in or within six weeks of turning six. So now is a good time of year to start thinking about any of the kids within your OSEP account that would potentially be getting ready to transition. 
um, so that you can ensure that all of those exit assessments take place within the six weeks. All right. So let's actually get into gold and start addressing some of these questions. So let me hey, Catherine, we have one quick question in the chat sure. that there are two teachers going on maternity leave in early April. Should they do the exit assessment now or should they hand over that responsibility so that it happens in May? So there's, there's nothing that's keeping them from doing an, an assessment now. Um, if it's, is it clear that the child is going to be exited within, uh, if they do the assessment now, is the child gonna be exited within six weeks after? It looks like it, it looks like it. They will be going to kindergarten in August. So yes, then the, the recommendation would be to uh, complete it beforehand so that that assessment is, is done. We wouldn't wanna, um, if they're not gonna be receiving services uh, over the course of the summer, then we would wanna make sure that that exit is, is completed. Great. All right, let me, so I'm sharing here. And I start here. All right, so this should be relatively familiar at this point. Um, I wanna start by touching on those, uh, the dashboard that we had mentioned. So to get to the dashboard to review children um, that have an IEP selected, I'm going to first navigate to administration and then navigate to children. And from here, I'll go ahead and submit for all of my teachers in this uh, default program. So this is a all training data. Um, and from here under manage children, I have this option for select columns to display. So I'll go ahead and click the gear next to that. And there are several options here that I wanna make sure um, you all understand are available and have the ability to, to turn on. So um, one of the first ones that I would use is this checkbox here for student ID, as well as the checkbox for child ID. So the child ID is the gold unique identifier that is created when a child is added to our system. And then the student ID is actually the field you will use to enter the listed. Uh, and that's been in place for a while, but it's really important that we keep that information populated so that when you do need to transfer a child or otherwise refer to a child, you have a piece that is non-personally identifiable that you can use in reference to that child um, so that others can help you. And then the other piece I really wanna make sure everyone has turned on in their dashboard is this check mark for has IEP. So this will let you make sure that you have properly assigned an IEP in our system and that there's an official entry date for the child, as well as um, this is the trigger for what will turn on those other items 1C1 through 1C4, which are critical for your uh, indicator seven outcomes. So I uh, wanna make sure that we have that turned on. And then uh, I also think it's helpful for troubleshooting purposes to have your entry assessment tool and your exit assessment tool indicated as well. Um, and we'll get into that in just a moment. But for now, I just wanna make sure that we have first name, um, child ID and student ID, IEP, whether that's yes or no, and the entry and exit assessments selected. So I'll go ahead and click save. And then that's gonna populate in my view. And why this is helpful, it's helpful for me to look at it now, but the other piece, especially if I work with a large number of children, is that down at the bottom of this screen here, I can click export table. And that will let me actually pull this report and then filter and view all of the children that might have IEP selected as no. 
um, which will help me troubleshoot those, those records in, in particular. Um, so all of your children should be marked yes in this, uh, in this column, and this will just help you ensure that that's actually happening. So uh, on that note, I did point out that we want to make sure that Part B Entry Assessment Tool and Part B Exit Assessment Tool are selected. Um, and the reason why that's important is that once we get into running the federally mandated report, we want to make sure that the Exit Assessment Tool is gold and that the Entry Assessment Tool is either AEPS or gold. If anything else has been selected, it could skew the results for the federally mandated report. So that will help make help ensure that um, that report is populating with the most correct data possible. On that note, um, let's go ahead and review uh, the basic steps for exiting a child. So to do that, I'm in the children area, I'm in administration. And over here on my right, I have this option to exit children from OSEP. So I will go ahead and click this here. I also want to note that I am doing this process from the administrator perspective. As a teacher, you have the ability to uh, request an exit from your classroom. And there's a couple reasons why you might want to, to do that. So by having your teachers request that exit, uh, it's, it's confirming that they have completed finalizing um, their exit assessment and that they are ready to release that record, um, which can be helpful for if you, if you do have, if you are part of a larger parish, you'll note here we have this filter um, that will allow you to only view records that have a pending exit request. So if you wanna go through and just exit the children that need to be exited and do so quickly, having your teachers go through that process will um, let you be able to, to use that filter. Uh, if you're from a smaller parish, it, it might not be, um, as critical for you, and you'll still be able to complete an exit whether or not uh, an exit has been requested. So in this case, I'll go ahead and leave that unchecked for now, um, and I will select all of the children in my program here. Actually, I'm gonna focus on the ones for this classroom specifically, and then I'll click Submit. So from here, I again have the option to drop down to a couple things here. Um, since we're looking at only Part B uh, funding in this license, uh, IEP is really the most important piece here. When I scroll over, there's lots of columns here. I can see the class, I can see the primary teacher, I can see the entry date, and then I have the ability to enter the exit date in this column. So I'll go ahead and enter an exit date here for this child. And let's say um, I want to exit mini as well. So once I go over to days receiving OSEP services, you'll see here that mini has only been served for 59 days, where Joseph has been served for 783. So if I go over here to check eligibility, Um, I, I would need to make sure that Joseph actually does in fact have an assessment completed that represents his exit, uh, exit records. And then Minnie, because she's been served for less than six months, would not need something to, in order to be exited. Um, so here's where I actually go in and select the exit tool. And in this case, I wanna make sure that everything is teaching strategies gold. And then I also need to select the exit reason. So um, for Joseph, he is probably transitioning to pre-K uh, in kindergarten. Um, and then, you know, this child perhaps has moved out of the program. Then you'll note in the column here with the checkbox um, that I am now able to click into these individually. I will also note that if I check the box at the top here, um, it will automatically pull up all of the children uh, that have the ability 
to be checked for eligibility for exit. So that can be a time-saving measure that I just want to point out uh, rather than having to, to hunt and peck for uh, individual pieces there. And Catherine, this might be a good time to answer one of our questions in the chat box. Um, if you could scroll back to the left to show the dates for exiting. One of the questions is, should the exit be done within six weeks of the last day of school if they're going into kindergarten? So what should that exit date entry be? My understanding is that yes, exit should be completed before six weeks before the last day of school if they're transitioning into kindergarten. All right. And then the second question would be more so related to our kiddo who has been in the system for um, those 700 days. If a child starts their services at the end of a school year and then spends the following school year and then the following school year after that, is there a need to add two middle of the year assessments just because it overlapped over three years, three school years that would be? So that would be a decision that the the DOE would need to make. Um, but the guidance that we gave last year was that there would be that for, for children that were going to be there for two years that they would need one. Uh, so I don't believe that that has changed. Okay. And that hasn't changed on our end either. So for um, the purposes of following the guidelines that currently exist, you would only need one middle of the year assessment for that child. All right, any other questions? So far that's all that I see, so we can continue and I will let you know if any other questions pop up. Wonderful. So as I said, we, we've now checked the uh, box here for our two children that we're trying to exit and then in the drop down menu underneath this, I have a couple different options. I have the ability to check eligibility or to exit. And so I always recommend first running this eligibility check to make sure that we understand um, whether or not we are good to go. And actually, let me go ahead. I'm going to try to exit one more child as well here. And now uh, I'll do an eligibility check. So I'll do this and I click submit. And then this will tell me um, what the status is for my children. So in the case of Joseph and Minnie, and Minnie, if you remember, only had 59 days. So she's underneath that six month threshold for needing an exit assessment. Um, so she's good to go. And then Joseph um, does have an entry and an exit assessment. So he's also good to go. However, when we ran this for Jose, you can see that he is missing both an entry and an exit. So we're not able to take action on him specifically. So if, for example, your child has an entry assessment but does not have an exit assessment, this will come up and say, something along the lines of that there's no exit data and it will not let you uh, proceed with exit. All right, so now I will uncheck Jose and I can actually move here to exit. So if I want to exit Jose and Minnie, I select exit, I click submit, and then this is giving me one more chance to uh, make sure that this is what I really wanna do. So this is telling me that these two children will be exited and I'll go ahead and click submit. Now let's say I realize I did that prematurely or I've made a mistake. Uh, I can still go in and reactivate a child record. And to do that, I go to this option here, reactivate child OSEP record. And I can search.
And then from here, I wanna make sure I've got all my statuses selected. I can include archive children and then click submit. And then these two children pop right up. And to reactivate them, I just select the box and click submit. So questions about that so far? Let's see. Okay, well, let's take a quick look at the teacher flow. So I just want to point out um, that to actually request an exit, we would go to your drop down here as a teacher, and then you select the class that you are interested in. And then from here, I can actually click request exit on the left. And then I'm able to, just like on the administrator page, um, put in the exit date and the exit tool, the exit reason, and so forth. So if I want to request an exit, for Joe, I do that here. And then again, I have the ability to check eligibility or request exit. And uh, I also have the ability if I have requested the exit to recall that exit uh, as well. And then I just click submit, and I get one more opportunity to confirm. And then now I can see in this list that exit has been requested and I as a teacher have now done everything that I need to uh, to request exit. So we only have about 10 more minutes um, moving forward. So I want to fast forward to some of the reports that I think are particularly helpful for exit and for troubleshooting. So we just ran through how you generate that child list with all of your children that have an IEP. That's really helpful for comparing against these two other reports that you've probably used as an administrator but want to review. So we have the OSEP status report and the OSEP federally mandated report uh, for year end. And so I'm actually going to start with the federally mandated report. So if you, um, if, if you run your federally mandated report after you've exited all the children that you anticipate for exiting this year, you would then run this and you can do this in a couple different ways. You can choose to run it at the child level or you can choose to run it at the program level. By running it at the program level, you will generate the summative statements um, available for you. Um, excuse me. <laughs> And then um, the child level report will also let you uh, be able to find those individual child outcomes and also give you an idea of the exact number of children um, that have both an entry and an exit assessment. There could be several reasons why a child might be missing from your OSEP child level mandated report. And so I wanna review those while we have some time together. Um, it could be because you don't have IEP selected as yes. So if you don't have IEP selected as yes, it'll be missing some items um, that would not be pulling into the report, which would give you some trouble for your indicator seven outcomes. So to address that, you would need to um, go in and actually select IEP as yes, and then you'd need to work with the teacher to determine what ratings uh, would need to be available um, for that, that record. Um, another reason why you might see children missing from the uh, child level mandated report is if there's missing information for students. So if either an entry assessment wasn't completed, an exit assessment wasn't completed or finalized, um, or if any of the items were marked as not observed uh, and there's not an actual rating, 
uh, any of those reasons could contribute to why a child might be missing. The other piece to keep in mind is that any child that has only been served for less than six months will not be uh, showing up in this report. So we, this would only be looking for children um, that have been receiving services for longer than six months. And then another reason why we might see children missing from this report would be if gold is not selected as the exit tool. Uh, or if a different tool is improperly selected for entry, um, those things can also uh, cause an impact as well. So I want to make sure that um, as we're completing entry and exit, we keep those things in mind uh, to help troubleshoot. So that was a lot of information. Any questions on that piece? There's one question in the chat that asks if there is a report that shows the date of an entry assessment or exit assessment. And that's leading me right to my next uh, next part of the presentation. So I will go ahead and get right into that. Um, the report I would recommend using for that is actually the status report. So to generate the status report, you would go here to OSIP status. And then I do recommend that you uh, check the box, make sure that it includes archived children. And then I also want to point out here the default entry date ranges. Um, make sure to delete these completely because entry for your children, uh, certainly for a lot of children has happened for beyond just this year. And so we want to make sure that we're pulling the report for all of the children that you that are trying to be you're trying to exit for this school year. Um, so the exit date range is fine, uh, but we want to make sure that we generate it without information in these fields so that you have all of the, the possible children that, that could be pulled. And to save a little bit of time, I've actually already submitted this. Um, let me go ahead and do a different screen share now and show you what that looks like. So I've generated this report, and when I look at it, there's several columns that are of note. I can easily see here that um, I have student ID uh, entered here. And then I also want to point out um, that you have entry date finalized and exit date finalized. So under just general entry date and exit date, those are the dates that you've entered for entry and exit. But for entry date finalized and exit date finalized, those are going to be the timestamps of when entry or exit has actually been completed. And that's what you can use to validate uh, the six week window that you need to uh, complete uh, those assessments within. And I would also point out if you have uh, IEP selected as no, then children are not going to show up on this report. And currently the way this report is working is that the OSIP status report is looking for children that have an entry assessment already completed. So if they do not have an entry assessment, they would not actually show. So you can validate that by, again, referring back to your um, export table of children from um, that we looked at before to see if you have all of the children that you need between those two reports. And let me go back to this here. And uh, that is the bulk of the material that we have for Today, I would also point out uh, one thing I, I meant to mention about the uh, OSEP program level status report is that you are also able to uh, receive your gains data uh, in addition to your summary statements um, in that report as well. So in looking at overall gains for um, your program, that can, that can be very helpful. Brittany, any other pieces you'd like to touch on? I know we just have less than a minute. I'd like to thank everyone for their time and we will certainly follow up with any additional questions that come into the chat window. Yeah, thank you so much, Catherine. Um, just to reiterate, Catherine and I are 
um, definitely going to be hosting another webinar very soon. Um, the report to submit to me at the end would be the federally mandated report. Again, we will make sure that we record this webinar and send it out to you, but please feel free to reach out if anyone has any additional questions and we will follow up with another webinar um, very soon. Thank you so much, Catherine, and thank you to everyone that participated.